Oh, what? <laughs> I'm Natasha and I'm Maddie and we're going to be talking to you about psychology specifically how it sort of went from philosophy to psychology like the very 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 start yeah yeah so we're starting with the origins so psychology as with a lot of other sciences started off as a philosophy and it wasn't until quite recently that it started to be viewed and studied as a natural science but despite its comparative youth people have been trying to work out how the mind works what the consciousness is and even what the soul is for millennia. Philosophers such as Plato, Socrates, Aristotle and Galen all looked into the workings of the human mind. Galen was a Greek anatomist and lived between 130 and 200 AD. Now he was the first to show that it was the brain that was responsible for the nervous system, sensation, motion and thinking before this was thought to be in the heart and in the stomach and he found this out by experimenting on animals. <laughs> <laughs> the word psychology itself was not introduced until much, much later. Its first use is thought to have been by Marco Marulic in 1520 in his work Psychology on the Nature of the Human Soul. Unfortunately, this work no longer exists. It has been lost to history. So the earliest known record that we still hold of the word psychology is from Rudolf Gockel. Um, he was a philosopher in the late 16th century. However, it wasn't until the 1800s where psychology really began to move into its own and away from philosophy. Yeah, so the 1800s saw the birth of two conflicting views of scientific approach to psychology, um, which is probably more akin to anatomy or biology. Which is important because I think when most people think about the origins of psychology, they think of Freud and his psychoanalysis and dreams and... Much more abstract, sort of, abstract. Yeah. whereas this is a lot more solid, a lot more scientific. Yeah, this is this part of the brain does this. Yeah. yeah. And that is where psychology started and where it's, where it's at today. It's come full circle. Yeah, definitely. <laughs> the, first, the first of the two conflicting views um, is the localisation view, which stated that specific brain functions and mental functions originated in specific regions of the brain. Um, on the other hand, you've got the equipotential view, which suggested that large parts of the brain were equally involved in all mental activity and that there was no specific um, in, in any particular brain area. There was a man called Franz Gould and he worked for a man called Johann Spurzen and they're most famous for providing good evidence for the localization view. I say good tensely. <laughs> <laughs> he used the method of cranioscopy and defined the intellectual and moral character of a person by the contours of their skull. Gull founded the science of organology, in which he defined 27 faculties which originated from separate brain regions. So for example, the brow which may be aggression and then the size of that brow ridge correlates to how aggressive that person was. So a lot of his work was actually he got the skulls from criminals because you couldn't really be an organ donor back then. Yeah. They didn't have you can put it on the back of your driving license, really. But they just were handing out bodies of criminals. To yeah. <laughs> so a lot them. of a lot of his theory was on how particular areas of the brain contributed to criminal or aggressive behaviour. Gall is actually more well known for the term phrenology, which was it's exactly the same science as organology, but the term phrenology itself was introduced by Spurzheim after he separated from Gold to develop the theory further. And Spurzheim eventually came up with 37 functions of the brain coming from different brain regions, but the number does vary depending on which publication you look on. I think one of the lowest ones was 32 and then 37 being the highest. It was initially rejected due to the fact that it was seen to conflict with moral ideas of the unity of the soul and the mind. It's worth noting that it became more popular in the 19th century. Um, this was around the same time that eugenics was rising and phrenology was used to support some of the claims of eugenics. Um, Immanuel Kant and many other philosophers of the time argued that psychology would never be a proper science. They argued that it couldn't measure anything in any meaningful way and so it wasn't meaningful at all. And this prompted a huge sort of rebellion and people wanting to prove that psychology could be a science like, like maths. Yeah. And these efforts to bring psychology into the realm of science replenish the interest in the localization theory. That's the one where different parts of the brain do different things, specifically that put forward by Gore and Spurzheim. For example, two researchers, Fitch and Hitzig, 1870, conducted experiments in dogs where they electrocuted 
electrically stimulated certain areas of the brain. By stimulating different parts of the cingulate cortex, they found that they produced different muscle twitches and spasms. That, with the addition that they found that when they lesioned, which is means when they cut out or damaged that part of the brain, they were now unable to move that part. That made them feel that those parts of the anterior cortex were responsible for movement. And this is quite similar to how we deduce brain functions today. Yeah. Um, more famously, Broca in 1871 reported on a patient called Tan who had suffered from a brain injury and subsequently had lost a lot of his speech and language abilities. After Tan's death, Broca performed an autopsy and found that there was a lesion in the left side of Tan's brain, which he concluded was involved in speech and language, and it's now become popularly known as Broca's area. So just returning to the localization theory and the equipotential theory, Broca's area is an interesting case because it's considered to be the left side of the brain, it's a very specific area, and a young girl received damage to that area, and a few years later it relocated itself to the right side of the brain. It offers support for both views yeah. in that speech production is localised in most people's brains in the same place, roughly, most of the time. But if there is damage, the brain has equipotential to recreate that same function okay. somewhere else in the brain. Yeah, definitely. A lot of the early experiments in psychology, though, did focus on the role of organisation in the brain and how that related to various behaviours. Behaviours which were concrete, that is, measurable, such as language and movement. It wasn't until the 1800s William James that psychology really moved into the realm of more abstract ideas. James in the 1890s saw the nervous system as a functional machine consisting of new, numerous paths to different behaviours. He suggested that humans were unique in their ability to independently learn new behaviours and construct new paths. Which we will see is not correct. <laughs> Um, so, for example, he would say that being able to play the piano is simply a case of doing it over and over again until your brain works out the quickest pathway to that behaviour. This idea of repeated activation resulting in stronger and more easy to use neural pathways is still held in psychology today and many psychology students and psychologists will be very familiar with the phrase, neurons that fire together, wire together. <laughs> the more abstract ideas in psychology such as emotion which is discussed by James are still widely debated. James considered emotions to be a perception or experience of physical changes in response to a stimulus. That is, you see a bear, your body instantly trembles and then your brain interprets that trembling as fear. It's not that you tremble because you're fearful, it's your brain has a biological reaction and then your brain tries to work out what's going on by labelling it with an emotion. Psychological questions such as the function and process of emotions and the definition of consciousness and the organisation of the brain are still being explored, debated and defined by psychologists today. Whilst these original questions still exist, psychology as a field of science has grown remarkably. Um, it now considers topics like animal and human behaviour, social psychology, child development and the nature of psychological illnesses. It's a vast and complex field of study incorporating elements of biology, chemistry, physics and mathematics in its attempt to explain the minds and behaviours of both humans and animals. Our goal is to explore psychology in as much detail as possible, so we are going to break it down. We're going to look at the past, we're going to look at what's going on at the moment, and we're going to try and think about what might happen in the future. Join us next week and we will discuss the very first theories that we came up with as a species to explain the link between environment and behaviour. Thanks for watching! Like and subscribe. <laughs>